Um, all of us introduce me, and can you hear me from behind? It's okay? All right, so um, what I'm going to share with you today is about mutual funds. Uh, when all of us asked me, or well, when MSM asked me well, whether I could deliver something, and I thought, well, what could I do? Um, for most people, I think something that's relevant uh, in the world of finance, and I thought what came to mind was mutual funds. Because when you think about investing, uh, typically most people will put their money in a fund. And I think uh, more often than not, you're always wondering what, what is in a fund? What does a fund do for us? Uh, what are the hidden secrets that people don't tell you about funds? Uh, when a fund manager tries to sell it to you or a marketer tries to sell it to you, what does he not tell you uh, about the funds? So I thought this is something that I will share with you today. What we will do at the end of this session is uh, I'm going to ask you to look at some funds and tell me what you think about them, uh, how would you analyze them. So picking up from the little ideas that I'll share with you uh, in the next couple of slides, at the end of the session I will distribute some funds and uh, we will learn something about it. Alright, so that's the aim of what I'm going to share with you today. Uh, so I think you have... Um, couple of things. Um, this is my email address. Uh, you've got, well, there's a Facebook for Amazon, there's a Twitter account. Uh, you're certainly welcome to <laughs> join uh, the Facebook. All right. Um, maybe as a start, I thought I should ask you how much you know about funds so that we see the before and we'll see the after. Yeah, so hopefully in this crash course, one hour from now, you'll be a little bit more aware of what funds are and to perhaps be able to ask questions that are relevant. So this is my pop quiz for you. I'm trying to see whether you can answer any of these questions. Yeah, so what is a load? Have you heard of a load when it comes to a fund? Uh, what about an NAV? Uh, NAV is in a net asset value. What is that? Uh, what is an alpha? So a lot of funds have got these words called alpha, and then you're wondering, hmm, what does that mean for us? Um, a benchmark index, I think that's probably easier. Uh, when, we, when we talk about cumulative returns, what do we mean by cumulative returns? Uh, management fee. Just trying to position this right. Uh, Annualized returns. So, could you answer any of these questions? Is the alpha the difference between the real value of the asset and the one calculated with finance formulas? Thank you, yes. It's the difference between what is uh, realized, what you really yeah, get, the uh, versus the what you could have, I mean, what the benchmark is, mm -hmm. or what you should have obtained. Yeah, that's the alpha. So in this session, I mean, uh, when, when we go through this entire lecture together or session together, uh, you should be able to answer all these at the end of it. Yeah. So let me start. Uh, prior to doing that, I think I should tell you some things about me. <laughs> I am not a fund manager. I do not promote funds. I'm not selling any of these funds. Or do I have shares in these funds? Yeah, so I'm actually telling you from a perspective of me, an investor, um, Oliver has mentioned some things about me. I lecture full-time these days. So I lecture in about nine universities in the region. So I kind of travel all around Europe, uh, teaching various MBA courses. Uh, the good thing about lecturing is that I only work eight months a year. So four months in a year when everyone's on holiday, I'm on holiday as well. So that's the beauty of the kind of work that I do. Uh, but what I spend a lot of time is in investing. So what I'm sharing with you are my personal experiences in investing. So I've been investing since I was 18. So it's been a long, long time ago. I'm like 50 years old now. So I'm really old and, you know, I've I kind of seen it through and seen through the business, I mean, the, the uh, business cycles and economic cycles. Uh, so what I will share with you are my personal experiences. So I just wanted that to... Uh, well, I wanted you to know about that, just in case you think I'm coming from a perspective trying to get you to buy something. I'm not. Yeah. So, what is a mutual fund? A uh, mutual fund is an investment company that invests your money uh, in a diversified portfolio of securities. So, you own, as an investor, if you are buying into a fund, you own a share of the fund relative to how much money you've invested. Yeah. So, 
When we talked about mutual funds, then we, we asked the question, how, when did it all start? Uh, so the first fund was started in the US. It uh, wasn't very long time ago, maybe about a century ago now. Yeah, so it's 1924. And then through the years, um, we got more and more funds. Yeah, so 1940, there were, you know, 68 funds and blah, blah. Uh, and of course, more recently, by 2008, you've got about 8,000 mutual funds in the market. Uh, we're looking at about $9.6 trillion under management. Again, this is U.S. data. Um, um, there are actually more mutual funds available in the market today than the stocks listed on the New York Stock Exchange and the American Stock Exchange combined. Uh, just to give you an idea how much there are, <coughs> the New York Stock Exchange is the world's biggest exchange. So if anybody asks you, oh, what's the biggest stock market in the world? It's the New York Stock Exchange. All right, so that is suddenly very big. It's got about 4,000 shares. So there are suddenly a lot more funds in the market than individual shares that are listed on an exchange. So why are there so many funds? Well, uh, another illustration for you. I've extracted this out from the Mutual Fund Fact Book. This is uh, not Romanian data. This is American as well. Uh, but just to give you an idea how many funds there are in the market. So this is 1990 uh, and through to 2010, so very updated data. And you're looking at about 7,000 funds in the market, so it's only more than the number of shares that are listed in the stock market. Uh, these are the funds, the, the numbers on top. Sorry, my um, laser pointer doesn't work. But you have also the assets, yeah, so how much money is being managed uh, and invested in mutual funds in the US. Uh, from 1 trillion back in 1990 through to 11 trillion today. So a lot of money that goes into the funds. And that's invariably the first place that people invest when they think about uh, investing. Yeah, so put your money in your fund. So when we talk about funds, there are many, many different kinds of funds. Uh, we have equity funds. Do you know what an equity fund is? A fund that... A fund that has... Uh, <laughs> okay. no uh, equity fund, as it says, equity fund, so it's a fund that invests in equities. Yeah, so equities as in stocks and shares. Yeah, so the stock market. Uh, and then we have hybrid funds, which combines equities and bonds. So that's the bond fund and hybrid funds are something in between. And then we have money market funds, which are very, very short-term investment instruments, usually very, very safe instruments like treasury bills, for example. Uh, and then, of course, we have various others. Um, I mean, there are a lot more funds out there than just this. But these are the very broad categories because we talk about hedge funds. We'll talk about ETFs, for example. So these are different kinds. All right, so also there are lots of funds in the market. And, of course, some companies that come to mind, uh, which are also definitely present in Romania. Uh, not all, but some are. And some, of course, you can buy them online. So you've got the Vanguard Group. You've got Deutsche Bank. Uh, you've got BlackRock, BlackRock does a lot of ETFs, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Schroders, uh, PIMCO, PIMCO is uh, truly the authority on bonds, so they create a lot of bond funds. Uh, BNP Paribas, you've got Templeton, I think Templeton has a relationship now with uh, Citibank Romania, and they're offering funds uh, to Romanian uh, people. Uh, and then of course Fidelity, I mean these are just some names that uh, you probably do know and have heard of. So how is a fund company different from any other companies? Yeah, so I have here uh, two illust an illustration, uh, the comparison between the two. So you've got a private fund uh, management firm. So if you're an investor, you put your money with an asset manager, and then the asset manager will invest in various portfolios. So that's your investor one, two, with the money, and that's your individual accounts that you own uh, based on your different portfolios. Uh, if you actually bought a fund, what you do is you put your money into a fund. Uh, as an example, you have the BlackRock fund. Uh, you own shares in the fund. And of course, with the money that you have, the fund company goes out there and he buys a bunch of securities or portfolio securities. And that's the investment company for you. So it's a little bit different. You don't really own the firm directly. You own it via an intermediary. And that intermediary is your fund company. 
Um, what are your returns from funds? Yeah, I think that's something that we are interested in. And I will also show you and share with you the performance of funds, whether it's worth buying or it's not worth buying in the long run. All right, so what we have is uh, you certainly can get money. If you buy bonds and stocks, uh, you will get regular sources of income. What they will do is they will reinvest uh, typically. Yeah, so income is earned from dividends on stocks and interest on bonds. Uh, I hope you know the difference between a stock and a bond. I'm, I'm making the assumption that you do. Um, maybe just to share with you. Yeah, when we say equity, uh, equity <laughs> and debt are two ends of the spectrum, yeah, or two very, very distinct classes of instruments. Uh, equity is the stocks or shares, depending on which part of the world you come from. Which is American, which is British. Stock is American. Yeah, stock is American, yeah. And British or Australian, I mean, all the Commonwealth countries will say shares, like in Singapore, for example. And debt instruments, usually we look at bonds. Yeah, and that's typical of the kind of instruments that we will invest in. Of course, we can look at bills, if it's the US Treasury bills. We can look at notes as well, which is slightly shorter term than bonds. And, um, Funds also create what we call hybrids. Yeah, so they have a combination in their portfolio of some equity instruments and some debt instruments. And that's really what it is. Yeah, so you can get income from the dividends. Uh, you can also get interest income from bonds. And what they can do is they can pay it out to you. You can choose to receive the funds in the form of a distribution. A distribution is when you get these payments. The only thing with distributions is that they're usually taxable. So there's always a tax issue. Do you want the money? If you do want the money, then you get taxed. Yeah. Um, what can also happen is uh, some funds, uh, they will change their portfolio over time, so they'll sell the shares. And when they, when they change their portfolio, then they will pass these gains to you in the form of a distribution. So they might, you might get a payoff. Uh, what is typical is the third one. Uh, what you hope is that the fund holdings will increase in value, the portfolio increases in value. So this is the portfolio that you have bought. So this is your fund. Your aim is that the fund enlarges in size so that you can sell uh, proportionately, um, you can sell what you own for proportionally more value. Yeah, and that's really what the last, part, uh, the last point is. Okay, uh, and of course funds also give you the choice to receive these distributions or do you not want to, and that's certainly a taxable consideration. Uh, when we look at a fund, what comes to mind also is the net asset value, that's something that you see it all the time, and you'll be asking yourselves, what is a net asset value? A net asset value is a cool way of saying price of a fund, so nobody says what's the price of the fund. Price, yeah. Uh, no one says what's the price. People always say what's the net asset value. So the net asset value is equivalent to a price of the fund. A net asset value is uh, the market value of all the assets minus any liabilities that the fund has <coughs> divided by the number of shares outstanding. Yeah. So net asset value are published on a per share basis, like share price on a per share basis. <coughs> all right. So I give an example here. Uh, for example, this fund is a hybrid fund. It's got some stocks, it's got some bonds, it's got also some cash. Uh, so the value of its assets is $53 million, and it has some liabilities. Yeah, maybe it owes uh, some fees to be paid with some expenses. That's your liability, management fees, for example, and that's your net worth. So what we do is we take the net worth, which is the asset value, uh, the net asset value divided by the number of shares outstanding. This fund has 15 million shares. And a total of, I mean, so it works out on a per share basis or per uh, unit basis, $3.48. And that's how we calculate net asset value. So every fund has a net asset value and that is published. Uh, and you will purchase at the net asset value. Uh, taxation of funds, uh, yeah, I've mentioned briefly about taxation as in the distribution, the same, I, I mean, this is just an elaboration of the idea. Uh, every time you get any distributions from a fund, you pay taxes. If you sell a fund, you make money, and that's also a tax, yeah. So a fund is what we say a pass-through status. 
So it passes through. So any money, uh, the, the fund does not deduct taxes on your behalf. You have to do uh, the payment yourself. Yeah, so the taxes are only paid by the investor of the fund and not by the fund itself. All right, um, just go on. So what are the attractions of mutual funds? Why do we even think about that as, an, as a financial instrument or an investment option? Uh, I think what will, well, probably on top of your mind, the first thing you'll say is diversification. Yeah, it allows you to own instantaneously so many different securities and you know that diversification helps you reduce your risk and we suddenly want to spread our eggs into many different baskets. Uh, funds also offer you professional management. Um, that's why you pay a fee to them, or uh, pay a fee for them. Uh, you can uh, suddenly invest in very small amounts, so it doesn't. You don't have to have a million dollars. Uh, you don't even have to. Uh, if you want to buy bonds, for example, a corporate bond, do you know what's the minimum size? So if you're interested in a corporate bond, say for example you're interested in the Coca-Cola, KO for Coca-Cola, that's the symbol we use, uh, the Coca-Cola bond, corporate bond, what is the minimum size, the tranche, to invest in a Coca-Cola bond? In the US, I mean in most markets, it's uh, $100,000, yeah, or 100,000 euros, so it's a lot of money. Uh, what then happens is if you, you can suddenly buy a bond fund which might invest in Coca-Cola bonds and because you buy a bond fund they sell it in smaller units and typically it's only $1,000 or 1,000 euros. Yeah, so it's a lot smaller and instantaneously you can buy into not just Coca-Cola but certainly many many other companies as well and that's your ability to invest in small amounts. Funds also offer you services, which is valuable for you. Uh, the reinvestment of dividends, so you don't want to pay taxes, and you only want to pay when you retire, say 30 years down the road in the Bahamas, then you say, okay, I don't want to collect any dividends, so let it, re, uh, let it uh, be retained, and you can certainly reinvest and don't pay taxes until you withdraw it. Uh, there are also what we call withdrawal plans, uh, what we call target funds. These days, fund companies have to be creative because the market gets more and more saturated. So they have to think of unique ways of selling a fund. And this is a target fund, and this is what we call withdrawal plans. Uh, what it says is this, okay, so you are, for example, 35 years old, 30 years old, and you think you're gonna retire in 30 years time. So this is 2012, 30 years time is 2032. This is, so you buy into a fund that, uh, that you will get your payout at 2032. It's a target fund. You, you aim for a target. Your target is 30 years from now in 2032 where you draw all your money. Do you understand me? Oops, sorry, 42. <laughs> no wonder everyone's looking at me strange. Okay, yes, 42, yeah. So you have withdrawal plans and you can stagger this. I mean, you certainly can have a target at 42, another target at 52, and whatever it may be. Uh, you can also have targets not just for retirement, say for your child's education. So you know if you've got a baby and your child's going to get into Harvard at 20, so you aim for a 20-year fund, and that's what you can do as well. Uh, then we have exchange privileges. Uh, what it means is uh, you can, funds these days are a bit special. Uh, what we call supermarket. Have you heard of this? I mean, of course, we all have heard of supermarkets. But have you heard of a fund supermarket? Uh, what it means is a fund company offers so many different products that you can move from one product to another. So for example, at your age, say in your in your current situation, you, are, you, you don't mind bearing a lot more risk because you're young. But as you gradually get older, you say, okay, let's, let's reduce the risk. So you want to move from one fund to another, and it allows you to do that with, uh, without having to pay too much in terms of your cost. Yeah, so you can switch from one fund to another within the same supermarket or same family, and you can save some money. All right, so that's the services they offer. Of course, the convenience is you can buy, easy to buy and sell. Funds have got very, very high liquidity. At any point in time you want to sell, no problem. Uh, you should be able to sell most of the funds in the market today. Uh, so high liquidity. You know what liquidity is, right? Yeah. So what is liquidity? 
the ability to sell fast your to transform your asset into cash. That's right. The ability to transform your asset into cash. Very important. But there's another condition that's even more important than that. At no cost, no, not at no cost. Have no, a willing, having cost? a willing buyer when time. you sell? Uh, in a short time, no. Okay, okay. I give you an example. Yeah, um, I have. Okay, I have uh, my watch here. Yeah, and this is a Cartier, and I'm gonna sell it to you. It's real. <laughs> I'm gonna sell it to you for hundred euros. What do you do? I think most of you will buy it because you will turn it around and sell it in the secondary market for at least three or four thousand euros. That's what you would do, correct? Because I've dropped my price so <coughs> low that I can convert anything into cash almost instantaneously. So the idea with liquidity is you want to maintain market price because if you don't maintain market price, you can convert anything into cash uh, very, very quickly. Yeah, and by, when you buy into a fund, it allows you to convert most things into cash at market prices. So that's very valuable for you. Uh, compared to any other asset, so like real estate, for example, you can never do that with high liquidity. Yeah, so uh, funds also handle record keeping, which is certainly uh, helps or well, saves a lot of time and effort on, uh, for you. And it's easy for you to track prices. You can track the prices any point in time. All right, so uh, how are mutual funds organized? So you have a management company, you have an advisor, you have a distributor, you have a custodian, a transfer agent. Uh, the people that you probably interact with when you want to buy a fund uh, is the distributor. Yeah, so he's the seller of the fund. He's the guy who earns <laughs> some money from you that you don't realize. Yeah, and of course, um, the fund is definitely managed by an advisor and you have somebody who is a custodian. Custodian is quite important because if you say you've got so many funds, I like to make sure that you really do. So you need someone to keep track and to be accountable. Yeah, and transfer agents, some, it's a more administrative kind of uh, position. Alright, so here we have the funds, yeah, with all the different players. I mean, this is just a visual for you, but it's the same idea. So advisor who creates the fund, who maps out the direction of the fund, who decides where, how the portfolio should be structured. Uh, the underwriter is the guy who will buy. Uh, sorry, the, the principal underwriter, when they first issue, is the guy who sells the, the funds out. Uh, either to the public or to other firms, because we have a lot of feeder funds. Uh, administrator, you've got the transfer agent, then the custodian, and an accountant, um, which is very important as well. All right, so so much said about funds. Uh, maybe I should just briefly talk about uh, the different kinds of funds out there in the world, uh, and what kind of funds you're most likely to buy, and what it means. Yeah. Uh, the types of funds, so we have the close-end funds. Uh, close-end funds are very unusual. Uh, this is not common uh, because what happens in a close-end fund is when a fund company, so if you imagine a fund company like Deutsche Bank issues the fund, uh, he will not, the company, the Deutsche Bank will not buy and sell any funds thereafter. So he cuts the link and that the, all the trading that happens is between individual investors. Yeah, so all trading of closed-end funds is done between investors in an open market. The fund doesn't stand behind it to buy or sell uh, any units. Um, the, the thing with this, this closed-end fund is that at the end of the day, because the fund doesn't buy anything, uh, the prices are determined a lot by market demand and supply. Yeah, so it is not unusual for spreads. Uh, that means it doesn't transact at NAV but it transacts at a premium or a discount to an AV because it's all between individual investors. Do you understand me? Yeah. So what it means very simply is once you create the fund, you, you wash your hands away and you say, okay, I'll let the market trade this fund. I will not do anything else with it. All right. uh, what is more common is an open-end fund. This is the dominant investment company today, accounting for 95% of the assets under management. This is the kind of funds you're more likely to buy. Um, what is special about this, or what makes the distinction, is that the fund company will stand behind the fund and he will buy it. Yeah, so if you're going to sell, you're not selling it to another investor, you're selling it back to the fund company, and then he will then sell it off to someone else. So he stands behind to buy and sell. Uh, there, are, there is never any trading between individuals, and because of that, 
The fund is always transacted at the MAV, the net asset value, which is basically the price of the fund. So you don't pay a premium nor a discount for an open-end fund. Um, then we have a new product in the market which has revolutionized the, the, the fund industry. This is the, most, the fastest growing segment of the fund industry. It's called an ETF. An ETF stands for an exchange traded fund. So what it does is this, um, maybe I, before I can explain this, I need to take you a step back and talk about an index. What's an index? So if we look at an index, for example, the S&P 500 index that tracks the New York Stock Exchange, what do you think is this index? You can so think about any index, index like a CAC 40, a DEX 30, a FTSE 100. So what are indices? It's the aggregate of the 500 um, stocks that uh, are listed on the... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, think of an index as an average, yeah? So it takes, an, it takes 500 companies, the biggest companies that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange, puts them all together into a basket and calls that basket an index. Yeah, so it's an average value of, it's an average, um, of 500 companies on the New York Stock Exchange. That's really what it is. Yeah, so the average, you take an average, and it could be a simple average, it could be a weighted average, different ways of computing. This is, a, this is an index based on market capitalization, so how big the companies are, and on that basis, we put more weights uh, on bigger companies than on smaller companies. Yeah, so we can only do that. So what happens then is, instead of buying a fund, an actively managed fund, so any fund that you can think of, what you can alternatively do is buy an index, correct? Because an index gives you instantaneously 500 companies. Uh, so you have got yeah, immediate diversification. So this is why they created the ETF. The ETF is to mirror an index. Because you can't buy an index just like that. Uh, you have to buy an index fund or you buy an ETF. So instead of buying a, a fund that is created by a fund company which is actively managed, you buy an ETF which is passively managed because it's, a, it's just a computer software that, um, that mimics or just uh, mirrors this index. And that's what the ETF is. Yeah? It's a basket of securities designed to track a specific market or a specific index. What started out was um, ETFs that track uh, indices, like the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is 30 biggest companies in the US. Or uh, then you have that, it's called the Diamonds, because it's called DIA for the simple, and they call it Diamonds. Uh, SPY because it tracks the S&P 500, so they call it, it looks like spiders, and QQQ tracks the Nasdaq 100. Yeah, so initially it was broad market indices. These days you can buy an index for anything and everything. Uh, take for example, you're really you're really hot on uh, water, and you want to buy a water ETF. You can. Uh, you can think of any sector, any country in the world. Uh, you can certainly buy an index, and that sort of allows you to diversify straight away. So it is very similar to an index mutual fund. Uh, what is special about this is that it's, it trades like a stock. So like any stock in a stock market, um, what you buy, the price that you buy, is what you see. So it's real time <laughs> values. Yeah, so you can buy and sell an ETF at any point in time. With a fund, you cannot do that. Uh, because it tracks an index, what you notice is that it's very, very cheap. What do you need to pay? You don't need to pay any fund manager. All you need to do is have a good software that tracks the index. Yeah, so the cost is very low. Uh, I'll show you some performances later between an index and an actively managed fund. So this is what we call a passive fund. Yeah, it's passively managed uh, because you don't need a manager to manage it. <laughs> so that is, the contrast is actively managed. <coughs> yeah. And of course, no prizes for guessing. This probably costs more than this. Of course, you gotta pay for the fund manager's uh, one million bonus, one million dollar bonus every year. You gotta pay for his Ferrari. 
of course you're going to pay more and that's why the actively managed funds cost more as well. Yeah, so what do you have to pay this? Uh, it's just a computer software. Alright, so low management fees, because um, there's very, very little trading. The biggest uh, ETF creator today is iShares. iShares is part of the BlackRock group. Um, and you can buy a <coughs> single ETF uh, in the market. Then we have a RIT. A RIT is a, well, it's an acronym for Real Estate Investment Trust. Of course, then what you probably realize is it must invest in real estate. Uh, it's a closed end fund, it invests in real estate. Uh, why it's called a RIT? Uh, because it is exempt from taxes. Uh, generally because they need to distribute as much of the income to the investors uh, on, a, on a regular basis, yes, on a yearly basis. The two kinds of RITs, either you're looking at property or equity, oh, sorry, property RIT, which invests in properties, real estate, or you look at mortgage RITs, which invests in loans, housing loans. Okay, so, uh, and of course, hedge funds. I think some of you might have heard of hedge funds. Hedge funds are a strange um, instrument, I mean, in the world of funds, because it's not so common. Yeah, so hedge funds are not really mutual funds. They're more like partnerships. Uh, hedge funds are not regulated. Uh, of course, these days, people are saying that we probably should change the regulation with, of hedge funds, given the risks involved. Uh, and there might be some regulation over time. But what, what is special about hedge funds is a couple of things. Uh, I'll share that with you. First thing is who can buy it? Maybe that's more interesting. It's sold to accredited investors. So you need to meet certain conditions for you to be able to invest in hedge funds. And the condition that is laid out in the US, which is very much adopted in uh, Europe and in most countries, is income. So they look at your net worth a uh, net worth greater than a million dollars outside of your primary residence, so excluding your home. If you have investable assets of a million dollars, then welcome to the hedge fund club. Uh, otherwise, if you don't have that kind of assets because you're busy earning money, then no problem. I look at your annual income. If you earn about $200,000 gross basis in the US, then again, welcome to the world of hedge funds. Yeah, so it's sold to accredited investors with uh, income and money or uh, assets as a consideration. And the question is why? Why do you think they do that? Why, why define it in terms of money before you can buy into these instruments? High risk. High because losses. they've got high risk, yeah, definitely so. And if you are, well, if you've got a million dollars, losing $100,000 is no big deal. I mean, it is a big deal, but still not as big a deal as if you only have $100,000. Yeah, so they realize that, okay, if you have so much money, then you don't, I mean, losing a little bit is not so bad. It's not a big dent in your overall portfolio. The second reason is this. If you are very rich, but very stupid, like dumb, uh, which I think you can think of some people, but no, just kidding. Uh, but if you're rich and not very smart, then no problem, because you have so much money, you should be able to engage someone, get an advisor, to help you, to, to advise you as to whether you should invest or not. Yeah, so that's the reason why they lay down money as a condition. So if you are uh, part of this, I mean, if, if you're an accredited investor, then yes, you, you're welcome to the hedge fund industry. Uh, what is unusual about the hedge fund industry is this point here, which is very unusual in the fund management market, where the managers actually get a cut of the, the profits. Yeah, so it says here, okay, I can promise you a return of 20%, uh, but when I give you 20%, I get a cut of that profit as well. So they will take away, you know, they'll take a portion, whether it's 20%, 30%, I don't know. But they, can, they will take a cut of your profits. So they try to aim to give you a profit so that they get something for themselves. The other thing is they also invest their own money. So it's not just your money. They also put in their own money, and there's a lot of incentive for them to make sure that you make some money. Uh, they also require lockups, yeah. So they might say, okay, you know, you can't draw it out for a few years. But of course, you don't need the money because you have two hundred thousand dollars in annual income, yeah. And they use what we call, I mean, well, how do they outperform, and what's the magic that they have? Typically, it's leverage. Uh, they take a lot of margins, yeah. So they, you know, they put in a hundred dollars and they invest. 
two thousand dollars, something like this. Yeah. So that's what we mean by leverage. Uh, they use arbitrage. They look for mispricing. Uh, there's options, there's short sales, and they have very, various other complex strategies that is uh, <coughs> typically secret information because they don't want to sell the secret, and it's very hard to get the. Uh, it's very hard to to know what their investment strategies are and investment styles are. Okay, so that's our hedge fund. So um, since it's not within the realm of most of our investing, we'll look at mutual funds. Yeah, so mutual funds run the range between investment funds. So a lot of your investment funds are also investment, sorry, a lot of your insurance funds are in insurance and investment linked. Uh, we talk about pension funds uh, and various other mutual funds. So this is just a big broad group here. Yeah? Uh, so what can mutual funds do for your portfolio? So um, can they increase the diversification that you want? As an example, you're working here in Romania. Would you buy a Romanian Fund. No. A fund that invests in Romania, probably. You, you want to diversify, you want to get out of this country and at least try to earn returns elsewhere because you can't be in the US but you're here. So you want a, a fund that goes out of your country or out of this region perhaps. Yeah? Well, that's what you want, that's what we mean by diversification. Uh, do they offer you the expertise in areas where you may not be informed? Uh, or you might not be able to invest? As, as an example, the bond fund, you, can't, you don't have $100,000. So uh, sorry, as in the bond example, yeah, you don't have a hundred thousand dollars to buy a bond, so you can buy a fund. Uh, or in certain areas that you're not very familiar with, uh, say for example, you're working in an IT sector, but you want to take advantage of the energy sector, so it gives you the diversity and you can invest in these sectors as well. How does the mutual fund investment objectives match with your investment objectives? We'll talk a little bit about that. What services do they offer? I think that's something that you should ask. Um, and most funds actually do offer you quite a bit of services. How much do they cost? Uh -huh, that's the magic word. Uh, how much do they cost and what are the hidden costs? And what is the record of the fund? And we'll cover some of this as we move on. So let's start with the first one. What is the investment objective or the portfolio focus? Yeah, every fund has um, a predefined style. They need to tell you what it is. It's always right up on every fund fact sheet. So when you buy a fund, You're looking for the fun fact sheet. It's quite a tongue twister. It? But it's it's a two-page, one page, one or two-page document that summarizes all the funds. I'll share with you some fact sheets shortly. Uh, but every fund should have a predefined style. So what is it? Yeah. So usually it is the size. So what kind of sizes? Uh, what kind of companies do they invest in? Yeah. So large cap, as in large capitalization. Cap stands for capitalization. Do you know what capitalization is? Value of the market. Yes, thank you. It's the market value of the shares. Yeah, I give you an example. Uh, what is the capitalization for uh, Google? Yeah, so you'd be saying, okay, let's go take a look at Yahoo Finance and let's <laughs> let's Google for. <laughs> Let's, no, let's yell for your Google, oh, you never mind. All right, so, uh, so you go find out, and what do you do? You take the share price, and yeah, so market cap for Google is the share price of Google times the number of shares outstanding. Yeah. So that's what we do. That's the market, the size of the firm. Meaning to say, if you want to take Google private, that means move it from a public firm that it is right now, and take it private, so that it's no longer traded in the market, then what you need to do is make sure that you buy up all the shares outstanding, which is then not very cheap. Yeah, it runs into billions of dollars. All right, so Google is certainly a large cap firm. Apple is certainly a large cap firm. Yeah, so it's got more than US $10 billion. Then we have mid cap and then we have small cap. So I thought I would give you the small cap. Uh, the definitions are quite wide. I mean, depending on which book you read or which article you read. Uh, but usually small cap is less than a billion. So it's not seen to be very big. And 10 billion is seen to be the boundary for what is large cap. And of course, no prizes for guessing what's a mid cap. It's got to be something in between the two. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when we look at size, why does size matter in investing? Any idea? 
So why make the distinction between sizes? Because it's easier to sell at this figure. Uh, a liquidity. Uh, because uh, they, they are, are equally liquid. Uh, small or big cap. <laughs> Uh, there are different it's traits in you know, terms of risk and return and of COVID from analysts and this kind of things. Okay. Uh, yeah. It's not really liquidity that's an issue. It's more the fact that uh, it's about returns yeah, and risk. Um, usually, let me ask you. So if you have a large cap firm, so an Apple, for example, versus a small cap, uh, a small cap could be Starbucks. Yeah? Something that you can relate to, trade on the Nasdaq. Um, which has more risk? Okay, sorry, sorry. It's a bad comparison because we're looking at two different industries. So a large cap like uh, McDonald's and a small cap like Starbucks. Which has more risk generally? The small cap. Generally, the small cap. Yeah. So higher the risk. So what do you think happens to returns? Have to be higher. Thank you. The logic is high risk, high return. <laughs> if you can find a place where <laughs> where you can invest and it's low risk, high return, uh, tell me and I'll give you a million dollars. <laughs> it's impossible, yeah. Um, all right, unless it's a long con. Okay, but anyway, so no, it's not possible. So what that happens is size matters in investing because large cap companies don't generally give you the kind of returns that you expect from smaller cap and that's very true i can tell you what the historical return is in the u.s if you invested in the new york stock exchange so very very large companies yeah uh the s p 500 can you see if i'm right here yeah. i'm sorry i'm seeing like some of you <laughs> okay. Biggest companies in the US and I invest. Uh, do you know what's the returns? Any idea what returns are? Average. Average? No. Uh, okay, sorry, I also must say something. The average return since 1925 to today. On average year? Uh, per year, on an annualized basis. So average per year. 8%? 8%? 8 to 10. <laughs> okay, That's thank nice. you. I'll just say 8 to 10, yeah, it's about 9.4, but... Mm. <laughs> because it uh, depends on whether you look at dividends reinvested or not. So let's say 8 to 10 percent. That's, that's right. That's about right. Uh, versus, say, the small cap index. Double? No. 12 to 15. Yeah, 12 to 15. Yeah, that's The small cap index gives about 20 percent. Double, yes. This is since, this is per annum, yeah? And this is since uh, 1920, I think 25, 26. So it's a long, long time. We're looking at long history, a uh, historical period that is fairly long to give weight to what you have as a reliable basis or indicator of the performance of the index. Um, the S&P 500, very big companies, gives about 8 to 10%, which is not bad. I mean, if you think about it, um, on the US dollar, this is very good returns. Uh, and the small cap is almost double. Yeah, so size matters in investing, and that's one of your portfolios. Uh, the second one is what's the style? Yeah, uh, every manager has a style depending on which one you choose. Uh, if you'd be wondering what is that thing up there, that little quadrant, that's the morning star. Yeah, mornings, morning star. Uh, a mo have you heard of morning star? <laughs> okay, Morningstar is a website, and it is a website, like you have ratings agencies that rate bonds, S&P 500, Moody's, sorry, S&P, uh, Moody's, Fitch, they rate companies, they rate countries, I'm sure you've heard of it, you've heard of the downgrades that's happening in Europe, so that's your ratings agencies and they do it for bonds. In the fund market, the fund market, yeah, it's Morningstar. I mean, it is not an authority. It's sorry, it is fairly authoritative, but it's not like it, uh, you must sell it with a certain rating, unlike bonds. Yeah, so you actually get a lot of information on Morningstar, and they kind of put it in a certain quadrant for you. All right, so you have the investment style. So are you a growth? Are you a value? Are you a blend? A growth means you invest in growth companies or high growth companies. Value means you look for cheap companies, and blend 
course, no prizes for guessing, bland is a bland of both. Mm -hmm. So they have different styles, and of course that sort of uh, shows in the payoffs as well. Um, all right, the next thing to ask yourself is the cost. So we have figured out some styles. Uh, what about the cost? Uh, cost is something very important, uh, which is always hidden and it's always in fine print. The first cost that you should bear in mind is uh, an annual fee. An annual fee is sometimes also called a management fee, so it's annual expense ratio. The thing with this is that you don't really see it because they deduct it from the NAV, so you don't notice it until you read the fine print. Yeah, um, and expense ratios are a very big deal. And of course we know the active funds, uh, you spend a lot of money paying for these fees compared to a passive fund. I'll give you some numbers just to bring home the point. Uh, I've got two funds here, fund A, fund B. Fund A, uh, both of them give me the same return, so 10%, let's assume it's the SM, uh, similar to the S&P 500, so 10% returns, but very, very different expense ratio. Fund A is an actively managed fund, fund B is a passively managed fund, so you notice the huge distinction in the, uh, the fees. So of course my annual returns are net off the fees because that's what I'm interested in, 8.5% uh, on A and 9.8% on B, no big deal. If you look at the numbers, <laughs> just for one year, but if you look at it for 20 years and compounding at 8.5% for a $10,000 investment, what you realize is that Fund A gives you $51,000 at the end of 20 years, and Fund B gives you $65,000. That's a whopping $14,000 more, yeah, just by cutting your expense ratio. Nothing else changes. You're investing the same amount, gives you the same yield, same returns, yeah, and the same initial outlay, and suddenly your returns do matter. Do you know how I get the risk. number? Doesn't huh? change the risk between both, both of them. No. no. Especially in this period. No. No, I'm, I'm, I'm holding that constant. So I'm looking at the same risk instrument, yeah, two exactly the same risk. Only difference is one is actively managed because you have to pay for the, the fund manager's Ferrari, and the other one is a computer algorithm that, that mimics the index or mimics something. And both of them give you exactly the same returns. So it's just the cost that, that is different. So the expense ratio has got no impact, uh, it has got no correlation with the returns. It doesn't mean that the higher expense ratio you pay, the better the returns you have. Nothing. Uh, for instance, if you, yeah. have, if you know Soros and he knows that uh, you was, <laughs> I don't know, uh, regarding the S&P going down, he knows he's having a hedge fund. You have to pay him, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's uh, reasonable. Yeah, but, uh, okay, maybe sporadically. I mean, if you're lucky, I mean, he, if he's lucky, uh, yeah, you might be able to do that. Okay, the thing with investing is that you cannot invest for luck. If you do that, you might as well go to a casino. I think you, you get better luck there or buy some lottery. Uh, you invest because of the person's skill. Yeah, and skill means uh, being consistent. Uh, and, you know, having a track record is important. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, sporadically you might make it. But then, you know, that's like going to the casino, right? All right, um, okay, so that's expense ratio. The second thing that you don't see, uh, which of course is definitely there, 100%, is what we call a sales charge or a load. They call it a load or a sales charge. I mean, load because it sounds uh, not as obvious <laughs> than a sales charge, but they mean the same thing. Yeah, a load or a sales charge is used to pay the broker or the guy who markets, usually a banker, uh, and who sells you the fund. Yeah, but paying a load does not affect the performance of a fund, of course. Uh, there are many kinds of loads, I mean, sorry, there are the two main kinds of loads, either front-end or back-end. Uh, typically, you will pay a front-end load. Uh, so what a front-end load means is I will deduct the, the charges at the very beginning. So as an example, uh, you have $10,000. So you've got $10,000 to invest, and you go buy a fund and the guy deducts a 5% load. So straight away, it's only 9,500 goes into investing. Correct? Because 500 goes, the 500 is the money for the broker. So even before you start, you're already down. 
that's not very good news, yeah? Then the question is, how much can master fund go up just to meet your uh, initial investment? I mean, you invested a thousand, ten thousand, sorry, and before you even started investing, the guy takes 500, puts it in his pocket, so only 9,500 goes to investing. So how, what, what is the return the fund has to go or to increase for you to get back your 10,000? It's going to be higher. It's going to be high, yeah. It's, how do you calculate that? It's 5.26, I think I have it all, sorry. I've written it here, it's easier. Yeah, so for you to get back what you had initially, the fund has to go up by 5.26%. And that's a lot to go up in a single year. In a bad year, you might not even hear them and see something like this, which means you're losing money just with money. Yeah, so if you invest in a no load, so we have loads and we have no loads. No loads means no permissions, and there are some funds out there with no loads or very, very low loads. Then what it means is the $10,000 that you invest goes into working for you. So the 5% gain. If you do get any gain, then of course that's up for you already. Do you understand me? Yeah? yeah. All right, so we have front end, which is very, very common. We have back end. Back end is worse. <laughs> Why is it worse? Because this guy is not going to get his commission until you sell. So what will happen is when you sell, he will charge you, he, he will charge you more. All right, so um, that's very common. Uh, I mean, sorry, that, that's the tendency usually with the back end load. And of course, we have uh, back-end loads sometimes kick in after some point. So they have things like, okay, we have a surrender period. means I want you to buy this fund, hold it for five years. If you sell it within the five year, you will pay a certain fee. If you sell it after the fifth year, uh, and, and the fees keep dropping as you go closer and closer to the fifth year. Yeah, so after the fifth year, then you are free from all these uh, charges. And if you sell on the sixth year, you're completely free. Do you, do you understand? Yeah, so if you sell on the first year, you probably have to pay 5%. And they sell the second year, you pay 4%. So there are these surrender periods as well. I think that's something to bear in mind and ask if you have to pay any of these charges. Because the last thing you want is to lend yourself with more costs uh, when you try to liquidate your holdings. All right, then we have uh, some other things that fund managers do not tell you. So we talked a lot about uh, the costs. Yeah, and what else do they not tell you? They don't tell you about returns. Yeah, the returns always fluctuating. <laughs> Mutual funds do not have a guaranteed return. Typically, they don't, and there is always a possibility that your initial capital is being eroded. It's not preserved. Yeah, so there is always this rule. Uh, there is capital. <laughs> you need to preserve your capital. Yeah, preservation, at least. And most funds don't do this at all. Right, they don't preserve your capital. Um, so when you decide on the fund to buy, I think you need to look at the risks involved and ask yourself a couple of questions, or ask the fund manager, the guy who's selling you a couple of questions. Can you tell me what is the track record of the fund? Uh, track record tells you the history, unfortunately, but at least you have a basis. Uh, what you should be looking at is a three-year, a five-year, or if possible, a 10-year track record. Only thing is many funds in the market today have not been around for so many years. And if they do, uh, usually after the 10, they, they have a shelf life. After a certain number of years, they will decide to end the fund. The reason is because strategies change and they want to change their focus and start a new fund. Yeah, so they don't keep a fund for a long, long time. You don't see a 50-year fund. So every few years, 10, 10, about 10 years about the, the limit and they will rethink and recreate another fund. So what you should be looking at is probably a three-year or a five-year uh, return and look at what the track record is. Look at who is the manager during this period. So it's likely that see, if the manager is the same and if the five-year track record is good, then you can probably extrapolate and say, yeah, maybe in the next two to three years it will be okay. Yeah, but it's of course no guarantee. What you should look at is the annual net annual returns. I'll show you later some fact sheets and you realize that every company has a different way of presenting the information. <coughs> of course, they always want to present it in a way that puts their fun uh, in the, or paints the nicest picture of their fun. Yeah, so I think you need to figure out what kind of returns are they showing you. What you should look at is net, net of all the costs 
and annual returns, annualized basis. Then it facilitates comparison and not cumulative returns. You know what cumulative returns are? Yeah, I aggregate the returns. So if I say you've got a 50% return, the question is over how many years? If you got a 50% return over 50 years, it's no big deal. If you got a 50% return on one year, it's very, very big deal. So I need to look at it on a per year basis. All right, so what else should you ask? Um, you should also look at the benchmark. So relative to the benchmark, how has this fund performed? That's very important because every fund tries to, uh, it needs to be judged and they will be judged against a benchmark. Yeah, so how it rates relative to other funds with similar approach and relative to the benchmark. And of course, what you want is a fund that consistently ranks 40 to 50 percent of its category class. Uh, like I said, Morningstar can give you a listing of every single fund out there you can sort based on what is uh, top performing and take the 40 percent, uh, 40 to 50 percent of the top half. Um, so what fund managers do not tell you? Oh, maybe I should share something else with you. Do you know why I say this? <laughs> Nobody questions what I say. <laughs> All right. Why do I say you should um, consist? You should want a fund. Or ideally, you want a fund that consistently ranks in the top forty to fifty percent of its category class. Do you know why I say that? Because there are many studies that have shown this. Okay. So what they do is this. They look at two time periods, yeah, say uh, year one and year two. Yeah, and of course we do not know what fund, so we do a sort. Yeah, so we go to Morningstar and do a sort. And so what we do is we sort for good and bad funds, yeah, or basically returns for the year and which are the best ones and which are the worst ones. So we divide into two. This is 50% and this is 50%. This is um, good. I'll just say this is bad, as in the lowest rank. Yeah, I, I just do a ranking. Uh, what then happens is I want to see whether this funds, these good funds, I mean, whether there is a prediction, a predictability effect, that if this year they are good, they're likely to be good the following year. Then I know, okay, you know, if that's the case, then I should always look for the top 50% and see whether it persists. So the, the irony of it all is, it's very, very, <laughs> okay, I'll show you the results first. The results show this, yeah. If I look at the second year, and I'm wondering, okay, will the top 50 still remain the top 50? Do you know what the results were? <laughs> no, not reverse. Yeah, it, uh, but the, um, okay, sorry, the top 50 is unlikely to be the top 50, it's, no, this part is uncertain, but the bottom 50 will always say the bottom 50. Mm. <laughs> Do you understand me? Yeah. yeah, so it's more likely that if you are bad, you will persist and remain bad. <laughs> but if you're good, it's very hard to identify the secrets of why you are good. And where do the 50 go? 50% of good. No, they, they will just kind of move around. But the bad ones, I mean, maybe 50 is. Uh, yeah, maybe 50 is too high. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's yeah. the bottom ones, yeah? So the bottom ones will always stay <laughs> bottom. But the top ones kind of yeah. move around that you can't quite tell. But at least you know you should avoid the bottom ones. Because what you want is the top ones, even though they might move around and like musical chairs and move in different, uh, yeah, different rankings. But they're still not the bottom ones. And that's why we say we should look at things that are at least top 40 to 50% of its category class, you know, rather than the bottom. So basically, just weed out the bottom and ignore them because it's more likely that they will continue to be bad. It's studies that have shown this, uh, and repeatedly over the years, not just a one period study or a two period study. All right, um, diversification. What fund managers do not tell you, yeah? Uh, the idea of the diversification is this. Uh, if you think about, if I asked you, I mean, if you have a windfall of $100,000, you go, yeah, that's great, yeah, let's throw a party. <laughs> uh, or let's go buy an MBA. But anyway, uh, let's ima imagine if you want to invest this amount of money. Then you say, okay, maybe what I should do is buy a bunch of funds. 
The only problem is a lot of the funds are very, very correlated. These days, you're going to see increasing correlations amongst different markets. So when China is down, you're probably going to see India is down as well. Markets are correlated. Yeah, so it's no use buying, um, taking your $100,000 and buying 20 different funds because you're not reducing your risk. So do you understand me? And that's what we mean by over-diversification. Incrementally, it doesn't reduce your risk. It's better to say, okay, if I have $100,000, I'm just going to buy four funds and leave it as that and not buy 20 funds just because I want to diversify and diversify and diversify. Incrementally, you cannot diversify so much. Yeah, so your marginal returns from diversification will fall with each fund. Um, cash is something that you tend to see a lot. Uh, funds hold a lot of cash. Some, I mean, some of the funds that I'm going to show it to you, they hold about 20% of the entire portfolio in cash. Uh, that's a bit silly because if you buy a fund, you want all of the money to work for you, to invest, to be invested, not to be held in cash. Cash earns you almost nothing in return today. <coughs> almost nothing, unless you, you buy into a very high risk currency like the Hungarian foreign. Uh, you know, otherwise your returns are, are peanuts. Yeah, so you don't want that to do, I mean, if, if that's what you are going to be doing, buying to a fund with a lot of cash, you might as well just buy an index, because all the money goes into working for you. Um, misleading ads. Yeah, um, there are lots of ads, <laughs> and they always advertise, and the thing with ads is that sometimes they don't tell you the truth about what happens. Uh, I'll give you an example. There are funds, uh, okay, maybe I should also say something about the U.S. first. Uh, the U.S. SEC, SEC is the yeah, thank you. The Securities Exchange Commission is the governing body uh, that sort of governs all the securities in the U.S. And it says here, okay, if you want a fund, no problem. Yeah, your your fund name, the name of your fund, uh, for you to use that particular name, eighty percent of its assets must be in that particular asset or investment class. As an example. If you say you're an emerging market fund, then 80% of your portfolio must be in emerging markets, not the other way around, because then you are misleading people if you say you're an emerging market fund and then 80% is invested in the US, for example. Yeah, and that's what it means. So you have a lot of funds with very strange names. Uh, recently, I was just looking for an Islamic fund, and I was looking for a fund with a very Islamic theme, just for um, a class that I was trying to illustrate something. And we found these funds, and the strangest things are these funds are invested in gold, and it's 100% in gold. And I don't know why they're called Islamic theme, unless these gold companies have got some Islamic um, ideology, or they have got, they, they, I don't, they, they are, well, yeah, they kind of comply with Islamic regulations, I have no idea. But, but this is what it means by deceiving. As an example I have here, uh, this is a global Schroeder. It's a very, very big uh, investment house. This is a global climate change equity fund. It sounds very, very ominous, yeah, and very, <laughs> it's like, wow, you're green and doing good. Uh, but if you look at the holdings, it's really weird because eBay is uh, one, is one of the top 10 holdings. I don't know how eBay is to go global climate change. <laughs> No idea. I mean, it's weird, isn't it? How, how about uh, Walmart stores? I mean, or Honda? Well, that... Um, Honda can continue. Honda can? The yeah, maybe in, okay, in the investments in green technology and all that. But eBay really was really weird. Yeah, so some of it I have no idea. Uh, but the problem with eBay is because they send so much. I mean, because you always keep sending stuff, it's not um, ecological. Yeah. In a way. <laughs> yeah, so you, I mean, it's contrary, right? To Are yeah. you saying it's contradictory? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that's how I felt no, I when I looked at it and I thought this was a bit strange. Yeah, Actually, on eBay they sell a lot of used products, so it's like recycling, so that might be... Yeah. So I don't think it's related. Related. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, then your definition for global climate change. We need a crystal really ball wide, to understand yeah. your idea. <laughs> yeah, maybe just, yeah, how do you define what is... I mean, so, so that's what I wanted to share with you, that you know, you have funny, funny names like this, and then you look at the instruments, and you go, I mean, the investments, and you go, are you sure? Um, uh, all right. Hmm? So, I was thinking, it's not that they are investing in green companies. Uh, maybe that would be the reason why they put all the companies inside. 
Uh, yeah, but it says here, uh, I'm trying to read this. Um, to provide capital growth primarily through, I mean, I'm looking at the investment objective and policy, which you guys can't read. Tell me if you can. Uh, it's amazing if you can, but I'm trying to read here. Uh, to provide capital growth primarily through investment in equities, equity securities of worldwide, worldwide issuers, issuers, which will benefit from efforts to accommodate or limit the impact of global climate change. So they're saying that the companies they're investing in are the ones that will are benefit, benefit, will benefit from <laughs> the efforts that are made by others mm -hmm. <laughs> for the global climate change. Possibly, yeah. I don't know, yeah. Okay. Anyway, this is a verdict open, so for you to decide, but let me go back. So the next one is costs, of course, I mentioned costs to you, but this is a different uh, part about costs that even if funds are losing money, like your values are falling, <laughs> uh, you still have to pay your management fees. No choice, yeah? That's why they're still having nice bonuses. Uh, then, of course, you got to read the fine print. Uh, fine print is very important. I'll show it to you uh, later when we look at funds. Uh, every fund has fine print. Um, only thing with fine print is that uh, I mean, fine print is about the risk in investing, what it means for you. Uh, but there's also one thing that I always say is that past performance is not a reliable indicator of future results. You know? That's how they cover themselves as well. Okay, and um, how to evaluate the performance? That's something that you do not know or they don't tell you. Uh, unfortunately, with funds, you don't have... Uh, criteria which you can use to evaluate. I mean, if you look at the stock, for example, ask to Apple, ask to Google, eBay, uh, you say, okay, let's look at the PE ratio, let's look at the earnings per share, let's look at uh, the growth rates. Yeah, so we have various variables that we can use, but in a fund, it's a bit difficult. What do you do? You look at the NAV. I mean, NAV is a very relative thing. Yeah, so there must be some way of comparing. That's why we choose a certain benchmark. But the only thing is, fund managers choose the benchmark for you. You have no idea what the ben why they chose a certain benchmark, and uh, you accept that. Yeah. So why uh, they don't explain that to you? The second thing is, they also show you a lot of rankings and ratings, but these are only past performances. They've got nothing to do with the future and what the success or the failures are. Uh, oh, okay. This is something of interest to you. Uh, if I showed you this table, you change your mind completely about funds. Uh, this is the comparative performance of managed mutual funds, so actively managed funds, versus a benchmark. Yeah, and we've got a bunch of different funds out there. From now we know what small cap is. So a small cap value means small companies and value investing with cheap small companies. Yeah, so a, uh, I'll give you an example. The first one, small cap value fund versus an S&P small cap 600 value. The second one is an index. Yeah, so all the S&P things, are all in, these are all index. So you're comparing an actively managed fund against an index and seeing how they perform. So what is interesting is the, the, uh, the scales here. Yeah, so it says here, percent of active funds outperform by benchmarks for the market cycle 2004 to 2008. So which are the funds out there that you absolutely will not buy, uh, actively manage? Are you looking at this bar? <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at the extremes, yeah? So this bar or this bar? The first one. The second one. The second one, you wouldn't buy. You shouldn't buy. No, the first one, because most of them were out of the Thank you, yes. So it's the first one, yeah. So how do you read the first one? It's like, let's assume it's 90%. So it says 90% of actively managed funds, which is a small cap growth fund, it's outperformed by the index. That means the index is doing better than the fund itself. So you should dump any actively managed fund that are called small cap and high, uh, small cap and growth. Do you That's understand wrong. me? Because you're better off buying a fund. Uh, um, index, index fund, not an actively managed fund. Yeah. But that's normal because of, because of the all the indexes were down in that period, and uh, they don't have fees. So if you get down and also add the fees, you get 
much more down. Uh, yeah, okay. Point. I mean, yeah, there are a couple of reasons why. The, pe the, period, a small the period is to blame for that. If you get a period 90, 95, perhaps it will not be the same. The percentage. Um, no, but, but it's you're a crossing. Cycle. Yeah, but you're, I mean, 2004 is still a decent time, you know? So you're running. That's the only uh, year that was decent. No, 2005 was okay. No, yeah. Fine. I mean, eight, I can understand. Eight and seven and eight, yes, I do yes. agree with you. So you're at least crossing, uh, I mean, you have at least three good years and two bad years. So on an average, yeah. Maybe it's, yeah, it's probably too short to come up with a conclusion. But generally what you notice is that, I mean, based on this, uh, what it's trying to tell you is that um, more often than not, an actively managed fund is not really that great after all. That if you were to buy an index, you're probably better off. And of course, the in, a lot of it is driven by the cost of the fund. Yeah, the cost of the, the management cost. Okay, and then we have, uh, what else about statistics? Uh, I think we'll go through this and we can have, understand it. So there are betas, you know, we talked about um, risk. A beta is a measure of risk. And of course, what we want is the lower the beta, the lower the risk. So if you look at a fund, and some funds actually tell you the statistics, which you want is a low data. Uh, we have sharp ratio. <coughs> That's something that you have as well in the fund. Uh, a sharp ratio is um, the, well, it's, it's a ratio of what is the returns relative to risk. So what you want is a high return, so a high sharp ratio, because you want the returns to be very high relative to the risk. Yeah, so it's the total portfolio return minus, minus the risk free rate divided by the standard deviation. That's a sharp ratio. And the last one is an alpha. All right, this is quite interesting because I think it's very important to ask yourself, what is the alpha of uh, a fund? Uh, an alpha indicates the portfolio's excess return, so what is your additional returns, actual compared to your required returns. And, uh, we want positive alphas because you want more excess returns and that shows you the skill of the manager. Yeah. And this is just a formula that we can use in calculating it. So when you look at the alpha, all you need is just to figure out is it positive or is it negative. Positive is good, negative is bad. And the more positive, the better. So let me show you something that is of interest to you. Do you know Warren Buffett? <laughs> yeah, I think most of us do. Not yeah, Warren, not personally, but uh, <laughs> vicariously. Yeah, but by some way, we know Warren Buffett. We've heard about him. We've heard about uh, how successful he is as an investor. Probably the most successful investor of our time, uh, and Berkshire Hathaway. So I'm going to show you the performance of uh, Berkshire Hathaway, which is a holdings company. Uh, He's almost like, this company is almost like a fund because it holds so many different companies uh, as a holding group. Yeah, so this is the performance of, I don't know if you can see it. This is Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, back in 1965, when he acquired the firm uh, through to 2010, so many, many years, we're looking at the most updated data. So what he has done is, this is what he does for his uh, shareholders. He writes these letters to his shareholders to, to show his performance relative to a benchmark. So why do we say he is the, the greatest investor of our time? It goes down to, it boils down to his performance. So what we have here is the first column that you have is uh, the performance of Berkshire. So this is the annual percentage return of Berkshire every year. So this is the returns every year. Uh, versus the S&P 500. So he compares himself with the index. And the index is the S&P 500. So we say, okay, uh, what we want is positive or negative returns? Positive. Yeah, of course, positive. You want this minus this, and you want a much bigger excess return or a relative return or what we call the alpha. Yeah, and you notice the alpha for... Berkshire Hathaway or Warren Buffett has been positive for many, many years. I mean, there are some strange years where he, he had some negative returns. What you're probably interested in is on an aggregate basis. So over this 50-year you know, period, uh, what is the average return? Uh, average alpha. The average alpha that he has is about 10.8%. 
So he has given a return much higher than the market. The S and P five hundred is nine point four percent. Yeah, and his yeah his Berkshire Hathaway is twenty point two percent. That's a very 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 uh, good positive return. Yeah, or in alpha. Uh, maybe also what is of interest is he's put in the overall gain, which is what we call a cumulative return. So this is returns on a per annum per year. The last line is cumulative return, so we aggregate all the returns. So if you bought Berkshire Hathaway back in 1965, held it all the way to 2010, um, you would have received 490,000% on top of your investment. This is 490,409, yeah, so it's almost 500,000 times, or four, yeah, 500,000 times. Your money has multiplied. Um, if you were to buy the S&P 500, which is still quite decent at about 9.4%, you're only getting a return of 6,000 over a percent. It's quite amazing when you look at numbers yeah, over long periods of time. And that's also the reason why his share is now traded, I mean on the New York Stock <coughs> Exchange, as the world's most expensive stock. It's about $120,000 per share because it started off, I think it was about $60 or $20, something like that, and then it was growing at a rate of 20% every year. So the compounding effect is tremendous. All right, so this sort of tells you, um, <laughs> well, a person who can you know, achieve a positive alpha on a consistent basis over the years. All right. Um, that brings me to an end. Uh, what I want to do now is maybe do something with you. Fair amount of information. Uh, Morningstar is up there for you as well. So the rest of it is just information. Okay. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, do you have any questions? Well, I guess maybe you already have the question. I've answered your question. So. Yeah, you can, yeah. All right, so, uh, thank you and uh, happy investing. Thank you,